Do you feel powerless, unseen, unheard, unvalued? Are you living an inauthentic life driven by the expectations and demands of others? A life dictated by your past, your wounds, your scars? Well, it's time to break free. Join Ellie Sheffy and her special guests as they guide you on a journey to leave the chains of your past behind and step into a life of your own design. Welcome to You Are Not Your Scars. Here is your host, Ellie. Hello and welcome. Today's guest is a multiple best-selling and award-winning author, sought-after international speaker, and dedicated philanthropist who has raised over $5 million for charity. He is the founder of Industry Rockstar, one of the biggest business training and investing companies in the world. And he is renowned as one of the world's most impactful business mentors. Regularly interviewed by major media outlets, he has been featured in over 300 publications and is a consultant to companies including Sony, Universal Pictures, Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, Apple, and Microsoft. Since 2006, he and his partner Alessia have delivered over 2,000 presentations in 32 countries, and they have taught nearly 4 million business owners their award-winning sales, leadership, marketing, and business strategies. Together with his industry rockstar senior advisory dream team, they have started more than 60 companies and generated over $2 billion in revenue. Committed to helping entrepreneurs align their passions and their vision, he is on a mission to help conscious business owners grow and scale their companies. Please welcome Kane Minkus to the show. Hi, Ellie. <laughs> welcome, Kane. Wow, you have had quite the journey. What was your first foray into entrepreneurship? Well, first of all, whenever I hear that bio, I always wish my mother-in-law was listening. That's kind of the first thing I think of. <laughs> Thanks for that incredible intro. So my first foray into entrepreneurship was actually when I was quite young. I actually grew up in a house where my father was a chief financial officer for a $500 million company. And so I grew up in a really, really wealthy, financially stable, well-off environment. But I learned pretty early that he was really not happy with that situation. As much money as he earned, he was just never happy. He was always grumpy. He was always unhappy. And I learned later that he worked for a CEO that was actually very disrespectful and not a very fun person to work for. But he never understood how to create any more wealth for himself or any more money. So he really stuck with that entire show for himself. And he was an employee his whole life. And although cared deeply about teaching us the great things, really taught us stay in school, get good grades, go through the traditional routes, and you know, and you can become retired and happy when you're older. As the youngest of three children, I just knew that that wasn't going to do it. And I learned very early on that money was never going to create happiness. It was going to create some options. We had a nice home and lots of, you know, ability to travel and nice bells and whistles around us. But there wasn't that happiness, that fun factor. And I thought, that's not what I want. I want to have a life of fun and passion and excitement and greatness. So my real first entrepreneurial thoughts started at a pretty young age. About I remember five or six years old watching my father put on his uh, Windsor knot. And that was one of the things I remember my dad taught me that I had taken into my adult life is how to tie a Windsor knot. <laughs> no tie today, but sometimes it's necessary. Anyways, and so I remember very early on thinking, I just want to have fun. How do I just have fun and have a great life? Because I was definitely conditioned, you know, him having a, high salary, his condition growing up in nice environments and traveling a lot and driving nice cars. And I thought, well, how do you have both? And I didn't know at five years old, but it right. became a mission for me is how to have both. And so I actually started in music. I was, my first love was uh, music and I started playing piano and singing at around five years old. And I said, I'm going to do it through entertainment. So I went down that path of entertainment and uh, ended up getting into performance. By the time I was a teenager, I was performing all over. I ended up becoming a record producer for Sony Music. And although I wasn't working as an employee for Sony, I was a contractor. And at some point at around 19 years old, I was producing and co-producing records and working on different records with famous artists that you would know by name. And Napster came along and it shut down the entire record industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a dinosaur like uh, I am, you remember like records. <laughs> yeah, right? We, we used to remember record stores and all those went out of business. And at that time, they stopped paying all the producers because mm -hmm. they got nervous. They didn't know what was going on with the music industry and sharing was going on. It was a big transformation. And I called up a friend of mine who was living in California. I was in New York at Sony. And I said, hey, we're doing all the work and we're not getting paid. What do you think about starting our own business? Of course, we knew nothing about it, but we were just as average as the kids. And we said, sure. He says, move out to California. You can sleep on my couch. We'll get something started. So I packed up a truck and I moved out to California and we started our first business. And at that moment, I was $40,000 in debt. 
I had blown through my credit cards. I had no cash in the bank. I had no knowledge of what I was going to do, no career. I had finished music school, but you know, there's no, you don't take any jobs out of music school. It's either created or you don't. And that was the start of it. And so my very first entrepreneurial career was launching a music business with a friend of mine. And I distinctively remember that we worked really hard for six months at it. And in six months in, my business partner came into our little bedroom slash office and he says, hey, my girlfriend is pregnant. And I said, hey, I had nothing to do with that. What are you telling me for? <laughs> he says, no, no, no. He says, look, I got six more months to get this business off the ground or I have to get a job because I have a baby coming. And I remember that kicked us into high gear. And I had a thought at that moment, which was the first thought I'd ever had this thought was, I don't know what I'm doing. And how am I going to get this done if I don't know what I'm doing? How can somebody get something done if they don't know what they're doing? Well, symbiotically, I happened to be doing some personal development workshops and things. I was, you know, I, I got into different conferences and things. And I happened to meet a guy who called himself a business coach. And he was uh, a really cool guy. And he said, I remember when I got introduced to him, he said, I just sold a media company in Los Angeles to move back to San Francisco to work with my parents who are executive coaches. Now, I knew nothing about coaching, executive coaching, business coaching. I'd never even heard of it before in my family. That never existed. Nobody had a coach. Like, that wasn't a thing. So I said, well, cool. Can you help us? He says, what do you do? I says, I have a business. And he says, what's a business? I said, it's a media company. He goes, great. How many customers do you have? And I said, none. <laughs> and he says, well, it doesn't sound like much of a business, but I'll come by your offices and see if I can help. So he came by and he met with my business partner and I, and he said, look, guys, I just sold a company that was just like this. And I coach companies. I think I could help you guys out. And we said, well, that's great, but we're totally broke. He said, well, look, I could take just equity in your business. But he said, I think there needs to be a little bit more drive, a little bit more commitment to it. So he says, what can you guys pay? So we scrabbled together about $1,500 a month. My, we split it. I was working, I was playing at a piano bar at that time, just uh, you know, performing and making some money to stay alive. And he took a percentage of our company and he took a little bit of our money each month. And we started building this business with his coaching. Now, this guy was extraordinary, as it turns out. It turned out his parents were some of the top executive coaches in Silicon Valley. So we kind of struck gold with it. But in four years, we built the fifth largest media company on the planet, which actually still goes on to today. And what we were doing is we took our musical talents and we created soundtracks. Instead of for records, we were doing video games, television, film, advertising campaigns. And we ended up creating more soundtracks for gaming and for film, television, and advertising than almost any other company on the planet. We were doing close to, I think, around 800 or 1,000 projects a year, some smaller, some bigger. And that was our first foray into it. That's amazing. So they often say necessity is the mother of invention. And what I hear you say is that that was not only true once or twice, but really that, you know, first... You saw your dad, you saw that he had all the material success, but that he wasn't happy. And that was a pivotal moment for you. I also heard you say that another pivotal moment was when your co-founder came to you and really said, I have six more months. We need to make this happen because I have a baby on the way. And the shifts that happened in that, walk us through the mental shift, the mindset that you had to develop when you heard those words from your founder and you knew something had to change. Yeah, you know, it's a great question because today, not only, I mean, I went on to start 24 other companies, which I won't get into all those stories because it take way too much time, but uh, we became serial entrepreneurs and eventually we started mentoring businesses and launched a mentoring company and incubator. Now for 15 years, I've been doing that. We've had uh, millions of businesses come through our trainings. But the interesting thing is that we work not only on strategic work with them, you know, every business owner needs to understand strategic work, but they also really need to understand the psychology, not only of themselves, but also of the marketplaces. So we look a lot, and I've actually spent about 30 years in human potential and development work, and we can chat more about that later on. But the thing is that you just said something that was quite interesting, which is this observation of other people around me and this necessity. And I think those two things are really important because there's this essence of intrinsic drive and, you know, I've spent a lot of time now, I've been on stages and toured all over the world, people like Tony Robbins and Robert and Kim Kiyosaki, people that look a lot at the psychology and the human behavior of successful people, because we all understand that it's a combination of both what to do and who you're being in, this, in the moment, how you're thinking, what your beliefs are. It's really a mixture of both. And, you know, some people say it's 80% mindset. I don't know, it's, it's, just, it's a mixture, right? You have to not only understand yourself and your thinking, but also understand what you're doing and how you're executing on it. And so, you know, I grew up in a family where it was a lot about you can't do it. You can't be a musician. I remember my dad used to say to me, hey, kid, nobody makes any money in music, so figure something else out. And I would say, well, but there are people that make money in music. And he'd say, like, who? I'd say, I don't know, Madonna, Phil Collins, you know, Peter Gabriel. And he'd say, well, they got lucky. And I realized that there are people that really believe that 
success in doing what you're passionate about and having a major impact is element of luck. And I just wasn't willing to accept that because I didn't feel like I got lucky <laughs> today. I am not a gambler because I'll tell you, if I ever gamble anywhere, anytime I lose all my money. So it's not about gambling. To me, it was about how do you actually understand who and what they do and how they think so that you can take what you're passionate about and be really successful. And I think there's this essence of drive for a lot of people when they're told they can't do it or they're not good enough to do it or it's not gonna work. And there's something intrinsically in them that says, I'm not willing to settle for that. I am gonna figure it out. And there's that drive and that commitment to figuring it out. Funny enough, today I have three children and we're extremely conscious about our parenting, consistently offering them great praise and love and encouragement and support so that they develop healthy relationships to themselves and healthy relationships to success. We work with them on money and success and sales and all the things that we are spending endless days recoding for entrepreneurs that didn't grow up in those environments. And yet there's an interesting double side to that, which is that we actually see, and this is of course very documented for a lot of uh, parenting, is that when you give the kids all the love and the support, they also don't get that kind of burning edge of, you know, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm going to prove it to others. So what we're very fascinated with is how do you create a a leader, an entrepreneur, a business owner, or a founder of any size company, whether, you know, we work with with clients um, that are from five figures or just getting started all the way up to nine figure companies. Really, it doesn't matter. To me, it's about human achievements. And when it's put into business, we look at the success patterns and the strategies. But how do you create somebody that is happy, that is complete, that is feeling grounded, that is feeling good about themselves and is driven? Absolutely. I think that's the million dollar question, right? That's one of the things that really separates people who are stepping into their full embodiment of life, who are taking life by the reins and intentionally creating a life that they love that life that brings them happiness and joy while retaining that drive to do more, be more, have more, and to live more, right? So what are some trends that that you're seeing in the clients that you work with? And how do you really help them harness that power and that fire within? Yeah, these are great questions. And, And I think this is exceptionally important because where you angle your passion, your drive, and your attention over your life, because, you know, to us, it's about a sustainable game. A lot of coaches, trainers, facilitators, speakers, they want to get people motivated to get in action. Actually, we actually end up working with a lot of motivated people that are frustrated. (laughs) They're in action. (laughs) But then there's also the sustainment over time. I mean, I'm I'm in my 40s. And when I was 29, I essentially retired. I'd sold uh, over a dozen different companies and I could have spent the rest of my life not working. And so I had to face that question of is what will drive me to go on? And then in COVID, you know, our company in 2019 was doing 200 conferences a year in 32 countries. We were bringing you know, literally 60,000 business owners a year together in different conferences. And then COVID shut down all of the live opportunities and live conferences across the world. And we had to say, well, what do we do? Should we just leave it alone? Should we take a year off, take a couple of years off? What should we do? Interestingly enough, there's a research report that shows that when somebody sells a business, or they sell their company, they exit their company, if they don't start something within six months of exiting, they have a very, very reduced likelihood of ever creating that kind of success again. And so I think there's an element of how do we keep our intrinsic drive? And I'll give you a few things. One is challenge. Humans are really driven by challenge. And whether it's challenge against somebody or challenge against themselves or challenge against competition or something, there's this element of being lit up by challenge and being motivated by that. And I think humans are intrinsically lit up by challenge and motivated by challenge. So one of the things that we do both with our children and ourselves and also our students and our clients, because we still run programs with thousands of students and business owners a year at all levels in them, is continually looking at how can we challenge them? Because many times people get bored at their businesses when they are feeling like they're not challenged anymore. Yeah. And they can even be running, you know, I've I've worked with billionaires who are, they're just, they're feeling lost inside because they feel like they don't want to be challenged by anymore. And so sometimes we change the challenge. It's not challenges about making money because it's not important to them anymore. It could be challenged by becoming a more powerful leader, a, a more powerful communicator, someone who can motivate, inspire, or show up in a different way. And that could be their challenge. Because to me, you can spend the rest of your life challenging yourself to be growing dimensionally. To me, that's really what we need is more dimensional people on the planet, more evolved people pushing out and challenging themselves in all sorts of different angles and areas. So challenge is definitely a big one. And and, uh, we encourage people to be challenging themselves regularly. Yeah, learning, right? Constantly learning, constantly growing. There's uh, Tony Robbins, in fact, likes to say, ask better questions, you'll get better answers. So that retaining that curiosity, the curiosity of how something works, how you can evolve, how you can grow, what the next challenge is, where's the gap for innovation, what's another problem that you can solve. I mean, the questions are endless. The challenges are endless and the opportunities to find them 
are endless. So you really help people hone in on those opportunities and then develop their passions and their skills with the strategy and the mindset to step up and be the leader to be challenged to evolve. So how did all of the twists and turns of your own evolution, your own companies lead you to being sought after by the world's leaders? Well, I think it's in this conversation. I mean, I had grown up in a family where my parents were constantly challenging me and my parents actually had a patent in brain development for children. And so I was the last of several children and there's a whole story too, but again, there's lots of stories. And when I was born, my older sister was diagnosed with learning disabilities and my parents went into a, a real research time to understand how do you develop a top level thinking because they wanted to help my sister become more proficient with her studies and her abilities. And she became an extraordinary leader and a very, very successful woman. But I was raised in an environment where we were constantly being challenged to keep taking things to the next level and think at different levels. And so as an adult, I started constantly doing that. I started constantly seeking out people who could challenge me, maybe because they were better than me at something. My mid-20s, I was working with a gentleman named Rick Beluzzo, who was a CEO of Microsoft, and we were doing some stuff where Bill Gates was around. And they would always say, if you want to have a really powerful experience as a founder, entrepreneur, or business owner, you should be the dumbest person at your business. Not because you're dumb, but because you're around people that are challenging you and that are much smarter than you that you can rely on and delegate, but mostly because you can learn from them. Yeah. And so I've always been seeking mentors, and you know, whether it's Kevin Harrington, one of the sharks from Shark Tank, one of the original sharks from Shark Tank, who became an advisor at our company and really pushed me and challenged me around thinking about deal making. He would say to me, why would you want to build a business when you could be engaging or pulling together parts and doing deals together? And I went, wow, that's so interesting. A guy who rarely would own things, but constantly put deals together and make millions and billions you know, of sales. This guy's done six billion in sales off of putting deals together. And that started to challenge that. And then I started to engage people like Les Brown, who is considered one of the top motivational speakers in the world. And he came in as an advisor in our company and started to challenge us about how we could tell stories better, speak more powerfully, influence larger groups of people. And you know, although I'd spoken regularly in stadiums of 10 and 20,000 people, he had spoken in stadiums of 80,000 people. And I had not done that. I went, well, what if we did that? And the question that we ask is, what if we did that? Not could we do it, not can it be done, but what if we did that? What kind of difference could we make? And this is a question we ask our entrepreneurs to ask themselves, not how can I get it done and not why should I get it? Just what if this could get done? What would be the difference? And start to understand how we can act as entrepreneurs to make a massive difference in the world. So I love the questions that you're posing. It's not a matter of can it be done? It's a matter of what if we did it? It's a matter of framing it through the lens of possibility and then expanding your thinking and putting yourself in the rooms with people more successful or people who have done it or people who are thinking even bigger than yourself. And, you know, we don't need to go it alone and we don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? To your point earlier, there are so many people who have already done the things that we seek to do. They've already carved the path. They're already doing something similar. And so being able to study, to your point earlier, how are they doing it? What did they do? What's their journey or what are the tools and strategies that they're implementing? And then being able to model that. I think modeling is so important. Now, you are in proximity with the biggest and the best. You have lived exactly what you're saying, which is don't be the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, go into a different room. So you've achieved all of these things. But the journey to entrepreneurship is definitely filled with twists and turns and ebbs and flows. It's not always as easy as it can sound. So share with us, what's the biggest challenge that you have faced on your own entrepreneurial journey? And how did you navigate it? So, you know, it's interesting, probably asking me prior to 2020, I would have given you a different answer. (laughs) But I think that the last couple of years showed me that adaptability is probably the most important skill set that an entrepreneur can have. Because there's a great quote, and I'm forgetting who said it, but I'm pretty certain it was a brilliant woman who said it in in honor of uh, Women's Day, which is, and it might have been Marcy, but as soon as I got a handle on life, the handle broke. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I love the quote because it's so true. I think as an entrepreneur, as soon as you think you've got a handle on something, you will be shown by the markets, by the world, by universe, by the economies, by your customers, your whatever, that things are changing. 
And I think that, you know, being a musician and funny enough, I have discovered a lot of really successful entrepreneurs, business owners, investors actually have some sort of creative background. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something to be said about the foundation in creativity being to take whatever and create something from nothing and be willing to change it or see it from a different angle in a moment, in an instance. And in fact, one of the things that we do with our kids right now is our kids are not in school. We don't school our kids, we educate our kids. And so our kids are trained right now and we are training our daughter. We have a seven-year-old daughter. We've been training her since two years old to be in the creative arts. She has been trained by songwriters and dancers and gymnastics. And she has been trained in all sorts of areas around creativity because I actually think the most important part of the uh, training for a child is in creativity, not in math or science, things like that. And so the idea is, is that creativity and adaptation and agility and ability to change quickly, I think is one of the most important aspects of an entrepreneur. So what I want to say now is that that ability to adapt quickly to the environments and the changes that are going on is the most important thing. And the biggest mistake that I think I've ever thought or ever had made is that we've got it and it's going to go on like this forever. And whenever I've said complacency, right? Where you think, okay, you've got your processes and systems in place. You have your team in place. You're on autopilot. It's working. You've got the results that you want. So, you know, you get a little bit complacent and stop innovating. Then (laughs) the handle breaks. (laughs) She says, hey, you're being too arrogant, <laughs> right? Don't be so certain that it's going to always stay like this. And so it's definitely that that essence of, hey, it's going well now, but what are we doing to prepare for and to look uh, long-term? I think as soon as we stop that, as soon as we get complacent, uh, to use your word, or as soon as we assume that things will go on like this, we've lost the game of adaptation, which is what a business is. Business is always growing or dying. It's never staying the same. And in the light of its growth, I mean, it, it, things can look like they're staying steady. And I think people have always thought they always want to keep this this flat line, right? But if we think about it, the way our lives work, if you think about the way our heartbeat works on a heart meter, it goes, you know, boop, up and down, boop, up and down. We don't want a flat line. That's a totally different signal, right? (laughs) We want a life of up and down and up and down. And that means we need to prepare for those. And I think that probably the biggest mistakes I ever made is when things were going really well, we would say, well, we got it. We figured it out. It's going well. It's going to always go like this. And as soon as we, you know, looking back on that stuff is when we did that, We did ourselves a disservice by not being ready for and future forecasting how things would go if things completely changed. Yeah. Would you say that the ability to pivot and adapt and change and future cast and constantly innovate and iterate and stay present and not get complacent is the difference between a five-figure entrepreneur and a nine-figure entrepreneur? Is that the secret sauce that really allows a company to grow and scale and be sustainable? It's definitely one of them. I think that there's a couple of differences. And I think that a lot of people overvalue motivation, to be honest. I think that if you just get out there and you do stuff, you're going to end up you know, in a, in a successful position. Although motivation is important and taking action is very important. I think that understanding strategy and business models are actually also very important. And that's why we've combined both because You know, I spent many, many years in personal development workshops and seminars, which were wonderful. And they were great for me to have discoveries about myself and help others have discoveries about themselves and have breakthroughs about how we were being with people and leading and communicating. It's great and it's a part. But I feel like a lot of the world has gotten overly oriented towards, you know, change the way you think or change the way, you know, you're motivated or get yourself motivated. That is one component, just like having food for the day is one part of your day. But we also need exercise and communication and social life and, you know, all sorts of different things. And so to me, understanding the strategy is very important. I sit down with a lot of motivated entrepreneurs and business owners. They come to me when they're motivated. So like when I used to tour with Tony Robbins, he'd be like, he would get them motivated. He'd say, okay, you're motivated. <laughs> now go to that guy. <laughs> like, you Now that you know why and you are motivated, now you need how to get it done and the daily execution of it and the strategies of decision-making and the nuances to discussions, conversations, emails, business strategies, how to be managing money. I mean, there's a whole world to that that I think a lot of younger entrepreneurs sort of say, oh, that's the details and that will get handled later. In fact, it's both. And understanding that, becoming really savvy in strategic understanding of your business, the details, while also putting in the heart and being motivated and having that passion, these are things that are extremely important to put together. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you're bringing up that point because I think especially during COVID, we're seeing an influx of entrepreneurs. The knowledge industry has exploded and the self-education industry has exploded. And I think what we're seeing is so many people who are, they're passionate, they're excited, 
and they have no idea the strategies or the steps to take to actually bring that that passion and that vision to life. So I love the programs and services that you offer that help them develop their strategies. So tell us a little bit about that. So I absolutely agree. So for the last 15 years, one of the things we have had a lot of uh, people coming through. So, you know, we help business owners from launch all the way really up to eight figures is what we say. And then if they want to exit their businesses or if they want to, you know, go public or whatever, that sort of becomes a different world. So we look a lot at from the launch to eight figure level. And from launch to six figures, we call it launch and grow. And once we hit six figures to seven, we start to actually work with them to scale up. And so we offer training programs and mentorship programs and workshops and seminars and advising to do this. And I think that we've been acknowledged as extremely world-class in what we do. I mean, there's a lot of business coaches, a lot of people that talk about it, but having had not only the experience in doing it, because we've started, my wife and I started over 40 of our own companies, half of which have been eight figures and the other half have been high seven figures. We've done it many, many times. We've coached hundreds of thousands of business owners through our programs and millions, educating them, meeting them, done thousands of private sessions. So we also understand how to translate that. That's a different skill set, in fact. Somebody can be really successful, and I've met incredibly successful people who've spent time with massively successful people like Sir Richard Branson over the years, where we've done a lot, a lot of different events with him and all sorts of fun things. And we've learned a lot by observing him, but he's not kind of the, he's not spent his life kind of decoding what he's done and turning it into systems and education and training people. It just hasn't been his journey. And although you can certainly learn a lot from being around someone so extraordinary, there are people that have taken the time to decode their methods and continue to research methods and turn them into systems that others can consume. And then there's those that are just inspiring to be around. Both great. But what I've learned is that I've learned a lot more from those that have taken the time to structureize things into training programs, workshops, or some sort of transferable, consumable education. So that's what we did here. We wanted to actually allow people not to just look at successful people and wonder or hope that they can break off a little bit of their success or hope that they can get around them. Or, you know, when you ask sometimes very successful people why they were successful, sometimes they have no idea why. (laughs) And they just haven't spent their life being inside of the decoding of it. They've been inside of doing their skill set or running their company. So we've took it upon ourselves to not just be a success ourselves and make an impact, but to really be able to turn those uh, those success systems into tangible frameworks that other entrepreneurs can learn and then apply no matter where they come from. And we've been very passionate about the international landscape. So we have had students and clients from over 80 countries, and we've been in 32 countries a year with our conferences, the U.S. being just one, meaning we spent the rest of the year in 31 different countries helping people from Japan all the way down to Indonesia and Australia and New Zealand, you know, and everybody throughout Europe and the Middle East and Africa, anywhere we could get to that we could be helping entrepreneurs and understanding that different cultures and different beliefs require an integration at different ways and different levels. Yeah, that's amazing. So when you are working with entrepreneurs and all these different levels around the world, what are some of the biggest limiting beliefs or struggles? What are the stories that they're telling themselves that you can help them with? Because I mean, you guys get right in the mindset, you help them because without the mindset, they're not going to take the action and implement the strategies that you're teaching them. You know, that's an awesome question. And it's a really good myth to bust because I think that a lot of people think that more successful people have less uh, fears or concerns. I have been with billionaires that have the same concerns of stay-at-home moms that, you know, are just trying to get their first business started. And a lot of it does revolve around things like, am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I capable? And there's kind of these, uh, these eight core questions that we notice people have been asking. And we often say, these are questions that are not only unanswerable, they're not even a question to be had. You know, the question of, am I valuable enough? Like the question is to me is like, why is it even a question? Like if you're here on the earth, <laughs> if you came to the human, then you were here by virtue of the universe deciding you should be here, right? There's actually much more important questions for success. And just to go back to your, your quote about Tony, ask better questions and get better answers. What I notice is that a lot of people get stuck in these conversations and a lot of it comes from childhood. So my wife and I are, the book we're working on right now is that we have discovered that there are about 110 belief systems that parents and educators, based upon the current system, inculcate their children into that cause them to have to work against the belief systems of success and wealth. And by the way, running a business is really about building personal wealth. I mean, you know, I have family that are very highly paid employees and they build very successful wealth. So it's not like you want to be an entrepreneur because it's cool. You want to be an entrepreneur because you feel that intrinsic drive to create something that's not there and take it out to the world. But your pathway as a professional is to not only serve, make a difference, bring great things out to help people through business, but also to create personal wealth for yourself and your family, right? And so businesses are really that vehicle. It's a vehicle about personal wealth. 
So what happens is sorry, a lot of parents, I should say, and a lot of educators unknowingly inculcate really polarizing and I, I don't want to say bad, but they don't work. There's their beliefs yeah. don't work. I'll give you an example. So one of them is that we tell children don't talk to strangers, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, we say strangers are dangerous. That's typically our response, right? So I grew up in that world. My parents used to say to me, don't talk to strangers. Strangers are dangerous. And they, they do it out of a protection, right? They don't want you to get, you know, I don't know, kidnapped or taken away or whatever. And so you do it because you love your children. In fact, in the 80s, in the United States, we used to have billboards along the side of the road that said stranger danger. Don't let your yep. children talk to strangers, right? So this was ingrained in the culture. But yet then we all grow up and we go out and we start networking in business. And one of the most important skill sets that we have for success is that we can talk to strangers. I get on stages, literally I did 250 events last year and 180 events the year before. And I've been doing 200 events every year for the last 15 years. I step on a stage and I'm in front of hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of strangers. And I had to spend a significant amount of time re-encoding a belief like that. And there's about 110 of those beliefs. You know, as a father, I can understand it. We were in Australia, we we're living in Sydney, Australia, just opened our South Pacific offices for our company. And I had my older son who was, now he's a teenager, but he was about uh, four or five at the time. And I was putting him into the car in his car seat one morning. And this young girl was walking by with a backpack. She was walking to the beach where we live right by the beach. And uh, she says to me, how you going? And I said, not bad, because that's how they greet each other in yeah. Australia. And I said, how you going? She says, not bad. I said, have a nice day. She goes, thanks. And she walks on. And my son sticks his head out of the car. And he says, you can't do that. And I said, I can't do what? He says, you can't talk to her. I said, why not? He says, she's a stranger. And I went, oh, and then I went, oh, <laughs> now, I even taught him that because I didn't want him to think that. In fact, I teach him a very different uh, belief, which is that strangers are actually friends waiting to meet you. Wow. Because I believe that that's who they are. I mean, I've met millions of people all over the world and everybody I have met was a stranger until I met them, shaking their hand, hearing an extraordinary story of their lives and their journeys and learning so much from every stranger that then became a friend. So that's to me who strangers are. But we've identified over a hundred belief systems that are limiting people. I mean, they say, don't play with money. We say that to kids. Why? Because money yeah. is dirty. <laughs> okay. Well, then the kids ingrain that there's something wrong with money. I shouldn't yeah. want it. I shouldn't use it. I shouldn't have it. If I have a lot of it, maybe that makes me dirty or wrong. And we're just talking, hey, it just comes out of a machine. <laughs> just a, yeah. Just a, yeah, yeah. But we say these things and we have mapped out all these things. So what, one of the things we're writing in this book now is to start to bring awareness to educators, parents, and even to individuals that are now have grown up. Because the great part about humans is that we are malleable. We are changeable. Yes. Uh, we are not who we are. We are who we are becoming. And therefore, we can become different. We might have to put a little more work in to ourselves. If we spent 20 years in a family that ingrained things and was very negative, or, okay, no problem. You cannot choose the family you came from, but you can choose the family that you hang out with now. And you don't, you couldn't choose maybe the beliefs that you were given or handed down, but you can start to analyze those, break them apart and reinstall new beliefs for yourself. You can actively choose your yeah. destiny. So that's what our new book's about. And, and we're going to be, you know, sharing because we've done this now, this research over the last 10 years with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of business owners surveying what were their beliefs. And there's a lot of surprises. I mean, you know, there's the kind of the core ones, like I don't feel like I'm worth it and I'm not bail, I'm a fraud. But then there was 80 or 90 of them that I thought, wow, I didn't even think about this. And if I wouldn't have, I would have said the same thing to my children and made yeah. the same mistakes because it's so natural. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the we're programmed with what we hear, with what we see as a child. And that came from the way that our parents were programmed or that society developed. And so I love the awareness that you're bringing in this new book. I can't wait to see it out in, into the world to shine a light on that and say, wait, let's evaluate. Does that belief currently serve you? It may have served you up until now, but at this point in your life, does that belief currently serve you? Is that belief a belief that aligns with who you choose to be, what you choose to value? And if not, then I'm sure your book will address here are ways to shift those beliefs, to create your own new beliefs, to create the new neural pathways, and to really be able to watch the language that you use, watch the perspective that you hold, watch the programming that you are speaking over yourself and your family. So I cannot wait to read that book. I know it will be incredibly powerful. What are some of the biggest fears or limiting beliefs and paradigms that you discovered in your research? So we talked about money and strangers, but what are some of the others that were recurring? Well, so one of the beliefs that I discovered and then tested. 
I was in an elevator in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. I was giving an event there with about 3,000 entrepreneurs that were coming for a three-day conference. And I happened to be giving this, this event. And at the end of the day, I was just wiped. We'd spent nine hours doing transformational work with them and strategic work and teaching and exercise and everything. And I was kind of just wandering to the elevator, just go back up to my room and fall in bed and fall asleep. And I get on the elevator and this woman and this young girl, her daughter, gets on the elevator with me. And I'm just standing in the back and her, as we start going up, this is a very high tower that we're in. I start hearing the daughter say to her mom, mom, when can we go to the pool? And her mom didn't answer her. She, she, I don't know if she ignored her or just didn't respond, which sets up actually a whole nother set of belief uh-huh. systems. We'll talk about another time. But her, her daughter starts to get persistent. She says, mom, when can we go to the pool? And children, this girl must have been seven or eight years old. And she was persistent. I love persistence. We teach our kids that when it comes to business or deals and things like that, no never means no. No means that you haven't found the right way to negotiate it. You haven't got it done. So we have a, a very persistent group of children. And by the way, just all the parents out there, be careful what you teach your children because <laughs> we teach them young so we don't have to recode them later. But I'll tell you, it creates a very dynamic and complex <laughs> home environment. Yeah. So this girl starts getting really persistent. She says, Mom, when can we go to the pool? Mom, when can we go to the pool? Mom, when can we go to the pool? Almost like Bart Simpson routine. Mom's broken, mom's broken. Like, <laughs> hey, when can we go to the pool? Mom, when can we go to the pool? Mom? And her mother stops her and she says, the more you ask, the less likely it is to happen. Mm. And this is all going on in front of me. <laughs> like I'm yeah. not there in the elevator. Like a little family, a little you know, discussion going on. And I had so many emotions come up at the same time. First of all, I got angry that a parent would say that to a child. Then I got angry that a woman in the world, you know, to honor Woman's Day here, is that a woman in the world would be told not to ask for what she wants, which made me angry in itself because we need more empowered women, not less empowered women, right? And then to see that as the source of that was to come from a trusted source, a parent, right? Yeah. And so now parents are training their children how to think. And with complete respect to parents, it's a complex job because you actually probably want your children to go off and become more successful, more impactful, more extraordinary than you were. And yet, you're limited to your own abilities of how you think, unless part of the way you think is to inculcate them with the interest in constantly questioning everything. Yeah, It's a very interesting dynamic and we have been very conscious of it. So we engage our children to question everything, to consider everything, to decide, to be persistent, to be resistant, to be consistent, to ask for whatever they want. And again, like I said, that creates a very complex environment because it's much easier to have submissive children, whether it's school or at home, to deal with complexity. But in fact, we have been willing to sacrifice the peace and the ease over creating human beings that we, because I don't think we could talk about it to others and then not demonstrate it at home, right? Absolutely. You can't say to people, the educational system does not support and then send our kids to education. Like we homeschool, have an alternative way of educating our kids. I believe that one of the things that's, I think the biggest dichotomy in the world about mentors and coaches is they tell people one thing and then they live a different life. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for integrated mentors. When I take on people, I, say, I want to say, I want someone who's integrated in what they're talking about. Otherwise, forget it. I don't want just someone with lip service. I want someone who has lived it, experienced it, has gone through it. Good, bad, you know, easy or ugly or whatever it is. So one of the things that we understood is that people are often told being persistent is annoying. And yet anybody who's a professional understands that if you want to get things done, like the Beatles who had to be persistent to get their records into the stores or even get signed in the record labels. Uh, Jack Canfield, right? We all know who has a great story of how many publishers he had to go to with Chicken Soup for the Soul rejecting him. Persistence was a key to success. And yet this woman who I'm not necessarily, I don't know anything about them. They stepped off the elevator. I never saw them again. And I'm going to probably assume that with those belief systems, she's probably not particularly impactful. And it's not a judgment. Yeah. Right? She's perfectly lovely. And however she does things is great. But if we're looking to create super achieving entrepreneurs and successful leaders with a dimensional and heart centered approach, feeling empowered, because when people feel empowered and they feel connected to love and they feel able to create, they tend to, and they typically end up in positive contribution situations, not negative contribution situations to their communities. Absolutely. So ultimately what we're doing around here is we're trying to create the most empowered people not just empowered with, you know, love and energy, but empowered with love, energy and money so that they can actually create whatever they want and feel powerfully connected as humans and souls on the planet. So what is your North Star? What is your why? I mean, we've talked a lot about really leaning into this passion and this purpose. Why are you so driven? Well, selfishly, because I do think people should be connected to their selfish interests, because I think that's important, <laughs> right? We need to be equally selfish as we are selfless. We, we work with a lot of women who put everybody else in front of themselves, right? And say, look, 
there's a good time and place and a lot of value in being selfish as well as selfless. So my selfish interest is to create a more functional and more powerful, supportive world for my children and for my children's children. I used to tell my children that I don't know why they were born into the world, but they're here for a very important reason. I believe that my older son is here for an extremely important reason. I don't know what it is. And as every year goes by, as he starts to get more and more interested in things like a climate change and his, you know, he's got a European background and roots, I think, well, maybe he'll create important inventions to change and save humanity. When I think about my daughter and we named her uh, Rania, which means singing queen. Uh, we actually named her Rania Bella, which means beautiful singing queen. And she's, fascinated with entertainment and performance and songwriting. Maybe she will write songs that moves the world and changes the way people look at things. And then our little guy, of course, who's just getting started and we're just engaging him right now, but who's obviously demonstrating huge athletic you know, capabilities. And maybe he'll be someone who changes the planet around in athletics. I don't know. But to me, what drives me is to be able to leave our planet in a better place. And personally and honestly, just directly, I don't see it heading that way. And I haven't seen it heading that way since I was a young child. I don't think yeah. things are getting better. I think things are getting worse. Absolutely. And I think that the old mentality, especially in America, because I grew up in America, but I spent half my life in Europe. So I have a very split sense of cultures, is that this idea that things will always be better tomorrow. There's always a better tomorrow. I think it's starting to fade. Yeah. We're seeing right now, not only over the last two years, but currently, presently, the shifts that are happening, the ripple effect that is happening. And so I think the work that you're doing is absolutely critical. I mean, not only with your own family, but with the book that you're writing and the ripple effect that that's going to have and the millions and millions of entrepreneurs that you've shaped. I mean, it is entrepreneurs and the innovation and the opportunities that are created and the ripple effect that is going to potentially, hopefully, <laughs> shift the trajectory of what we're seeing right now. And that alignment of a vision of purpose and standing up and saying, is this the world that we want to live in? Is this the world that we want for our children? Yeah, totally. And so that's very important. And I can't tell you how many, having trained millions of people globally, we focus on a transformational approach while empowering them with the strategic approach. That's one of the ways I open our, we have a three-day event that we've ran for over 12 years now called Start at the Top. And it is the essence of how do you just, you know, start at the top and then not just start at the top, like start at the top here to change things, but start at the top of your industry, start at the top with whatever you're doing. You don't have to work your way up and we don't have time for that. We need smart, heart centered people to be able to be at the top of their industries, their professions, their careers. They need to have that power so that they can make the changes because the policy making and the choices that humans are making are, in my opinion, not the ones that are going to be serving us for the future. And so we need heart-centered and conscious entrepreneurs. That's how when you introduced me, you said we're very focused on conscious entrepreneurship. And that is because what I've learned is that money magnifies what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. So if you give somebody a tremendous amount of money and they have a tremendous amount of compassion and empathy in their heart, they will create charities or organizations or companies or products or services or divisions, or they will empower people that carry those values as well. And that adds more fuel to the right fire as uh I'm not sure that's the best metaphor. <laughs> but, <laughs> the impactful fire, right? Yeah. To tip the world's consciousness, we don't need a majority of the world. We actually historically have shown that we need 10% to tip towards a consciousness. So we work on tipping about 10% of the world's entrepreneurs to tip it towards conscious capitalism and leaders. And sometimes we go into large organizations and people who are listening, I mean, the media is just so like, forget it. Let's just put it that way. Forget it. Forget it, getting anything accurate out of the media. I go into large organizations all the time where you have major leaders in or large organizations that care deeply about everything. You know, all the constant thinking that large corporations are just out for money and they don't care. It's not true. It's made up of human beings just like you and me that care deeply. And yeah, sometimes there's decisions that are made that I also would not necessarily agree with. But it is organizations that have complex tug of wars going on. And then you've got the small businesses, ones that can make faster decisions and they're more focused on one person or a smaller group of people's values that can make faster, more agile decisions. That's why I've actually chosen to work with smaller companies between launch and eight figures, because I feel like the ability to make quicker and agile decisions leaves me feeling like I'm making more of an impact with people that can make faster changes. Whereas in my 20s, I did a lot of corporate and Fortune 500 advising, consulting, executive coaching, and lovely people and great. And they're, everybody's amazing. But the ability to make a difference I see is in the power of the small business owner, which I would consider small business even up through eight figures. So I think it's all of our, you know, we're on a mission to do, and your question is, is why is I'm on a mission to empower as many people at that level 
to be able to make decisions, create the money, and then make the differences with their families and with the choices they're making so that we can come together. I don't believe necessarily that one person can easily make a huge difference, but I believe one person can start a fire that can bring together a huge conglomerate of people that have similar values and make a difference. What would you say to people who say, well, I agree with you, but I'm so afraid of doing the wrong thing. I'm so afraid of making the wrong decision. And so they don't do anything. It's a great question. My wife has this great, if she was here, you can, she's just a brilliant woman, an entrepreneur, and I'm so grateful to being with her because we get to share so much. And she's nine time on serial entrepreneur herself, originally from Italy and from Europe. And so she's a wonderful woman to raise children with as well, because we have such alignment on how we frame everything. We always encourage the kids to take big risks because we want them to expand and grow. And that's our thing. You know, we grew up in families where everything was like, be careful, don't take those risks. You can't do that. Now with our kids, we're like, go crazy. <laughs> let's take a go as big as you can. Like, let's see what happens. Consequently, again, it gets complex. When we go out hiking, my daughter wants to climb the tallest mountain. <laughs> Seven years on, we got to yell at her, come down, come down. But she doesn't care because we've built in, take the risk, right? Yeah. So she has a saying, which is that falling is part of the game. My sport when I was young was uh, ice hockey. I grew up in the city of Chicago, so we played a lot of ice hockey. And so I was a big hockey player. And so my young daughter got into ice skating a couple of years back. And of course, ice skating, you get on the ice and the first <laughs> experience you have is you all fall all over, right? And uh, she was a little bit disheartened because it's something that's harder to get started in. You start by falling everywhere. And my wife gave her this line that falling is part of the game and that every time she falls, she knows she's in the game. She's learning. She's moving forward. Each fall, each mistake is part of that. You know, the idea of failing to success or all those, you know, synonyms to how we would say this. But we say failing is part of the game or falling is part of the game. And so that's what I'd say to somebody who's saying, I don't know if I'm going to do it right. I'm so afraid to make mistakes, which is a very common thing. And we were interviewing Richard Branson about how he feels about making mistakes or failing. And I think we had about eight or 10,000 people in our audience and, and Alessia was interviewing him and she said, you know, you've done so much successful stuff. What would you say to people that are concerned about failing? And that's why they don't move forward. He says, I'm concerned about failing. He says, I don't like to fail. He says, you know, they, we, they had just had a crash with uh, the Virgin Galactic that had just came back. And he said, you know, when, when people fail in Virgin or Virgin Atlantic or Virgin Airlines or Virgin Galactic, people die. Nobody wants that. But we understand that as much as you do to prepare for success and to make sure you make as little mistakes as possible, falling and failing is part of the game. So you got to decide you're either in the game or you're not. And if you're in the game, then you understand failing and falling and getting hurt as part of it. And if you are not in the game, then, and it's okay. Like if you don't want to be an entrepreneur or founder, or you, so even if you've been in, some people have been in this, it's not for me anymore. No problem. Find people that you think are on deeply powerful missions and bring your talent to support them. That's as equally as important as you running your own business. It's not about what you're doing. It's about how you're playing in the game. And sometimes you're Michael Jordan and sometimes you're supporting Michael Jordan. But either way, the success is not because of one person. It's because of the team. Absolutely. Great advice. So just get in the game. And whether you are Michael Jordan, to your point, or supporting Michael Jordan, I love that analogy because each and every one of us has a purpose. You mentioned that earlier, particularly in the examples with your children, but each and every one of us has a purpose. And so just getting in there, taking action, being part of the game. Now you serve at such a powerful level. You are out there day in and day out, truly living your mission. You are a force for good. You are out there impacting and advising and mentoring and serving. So how do you refill your cup? How do you make sure that you are able to stay sustained and recharged and recalibrated to serve at that level? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. So I have a lot of things that refill. So it's some just kind of silly little cane things. But um, so first, of all, I, I love changing the dimensional modality for myself because it, it, it has me recuperate. So I love uh, athletics and exercising. I, I work out at least once, if not twice a day. We have a gym at our house. And I love to put on trainings uh, right now. I'm actually in a whole training around financing mergers and acquisitions that I'm listening to. And so I get to just work out, you know, for 45 minutes and listen to my thing. And that that kind of recuperates me because I get to contribute to my own education, my own growth, as we were talking about earlier. But I also get to move into a modality of, of physicality. And I spent a lot of years as a young person performing and dancing and, and moving. So I like to change modalities from intellectual into some sort of a physiological and a physical modality. But then I also love things like comedy. I listen to, oh my gosh, endless hours of comedy. I love, love, love laughing. When I would travel on planes and, you know, I'd go from, you know, America to Asia every 12 weeks to be running tours or to Europe or going to Australia for 22 hour flights, I'd be listening to 20 hours of, you know, Robin Williams and George Carlin and, you know, all these great comedians that I love 
over the years to just always be in it. So I love entertainment and I like to recuperate by doing completely opposite modalities, doing things that scare me. The kids love to go, you know, rock climbing. So we'll go out and we'll, you know, we'll do rock climbing gyms and things like that. Things that I think are really, really different. And that change of modality to me helps me recuperate. And then there's the other stuff, spending time with my wife and just being romantic and having fun. And we go out and we go dancing and we're taking, you know, salsa classes or zoo classes or and just changing that modality and having dimensionality, playing music. I still love to play music and perform and, and write songs and things like that. So to me, what I would recommend to everybody is to take time to do those things. You know, we meditate, we, you know, we take time to make our smoothies and all the, and do yoga and, to, and just then changing those things and keeping this dimensionality because I think that dimensionality keeps us much more balanced and the balance is what keeps us happy. Absolutely. So let's imagine as we start to wind down here that you have come to the end of your life best lived. It's been balanced. It's been joyful. You have impacted billions of lives for generations to come. You have played full out. You've left it all on the court. What do you want them to say about you? Mm. I want them to say, I don't need him anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the things that I would say to my clients and my audiences is that I want to get to a point where you don't need me anymore because I'm not here in this business to be a coach that's needed. I'm here to share the wisdom and the systems and the abilities so that it becomes integrated into you and can then get advanced and evolved into something else that can go on. So a little bit like a songwriter, I spent, you know, 20 years in music and songwriting and producing and to me, as a songwriter, we would channel through the artistic, the creative, and then we would give it away. And I look at that almost like children. Like at some point, my children don't need me. My seven-year-old, my daughter is so confident. She seems not need me already, right? And I'm like, yes, we won the game. More day nights. But to me, I work with entrepreneurs as if I'm raising my own children. They need to become self-sufficient and not need me if they want to come to me and continue to bounce ideas or have that mirror or that outside you know, that's very valuable, but they don't need me. And so what I would love billions of people to say uh, by the time I'm done is he came, he saw, he conquered, he left. And now I will carry that torch of whatever he was talking about. Because it's not about Cain, it's not about me. It's about the things we're bringing through our bodies, our voices, our thoughts, our minds, our souls, and then sharing that, evolving it, putting our touch on it, handing the torch like the Olympic torch off to somebody else and letting them run with it for the next you know, generations. And so it is. And so it is. Now, how can people get in contact with you? How can they learn more about your programs and the things that you do? Sure. I mean, all the classic sort of social media ways that we're active on, you can certainly reach out to there. Our, our assistants and teams check all of their messages and things and send us uh, things that seem like they'll be great partnerships and, and people who want to be part of our programs. Also, just watch online for our programs. Look us up on our website at kananalessia.com or you know, come find our mentoring programs. If what we're talking about here seems to resonate with you. And you're saying, you know, I'd love to have people who get the integration of the conscious and the systems, the strategies and the heart, then just come find us. We're pretty visible online. You can find what we're doing, find our books, find our programs, find us for advising and things like that. And then let's talk because we love working with great people. And although we like to take a lot of time off and spend it with our kids these days, we also love to continue to work with really heart-centered and driven entrepreneurs. So as we wind down, because now you're going to be bombarded, people will reach out to you because you're incredible. Any parting words you'd like to share? Yeah. So the phrase that always comes up for me is just do it, man. <laughs> like spend or, 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 you know, I don't mean to say man, but like, just, you know, just do it, you know, just, just do it. Like just take these actions. I can't say how many friends or colleagues or family members that I've had to spend years convincing to move on from something that just wasn't really feeding their soul. The pouting words is the action you take will always create a better next step. So if you're worried about whether the next step is the right step, the answer is yes, just go do it. And you will by design, I have never heard anybody that has really taken life by the horns ever said, oh, I wish I didn't leave that marriage I wasn't happy with. I wish I didn't leave that company I wasn't enjoying. I wish I didn't leave that situation. They always said, I'm so glad and I wish I would have done it earlier. The number one thing I heard when I would be sitting in transformational seminars at 18 and 19 years old, just because I got introduced to them early is, I wish I would have done this when I was your age. And I didn't know what that meant because I was so young, but I promised myself, I said, you know, if so many people are saying this to me, I should pay attention. And I'm going to live my life so that I never look back and say, I wish I would have done that. Just do it. Just do it. 
whatever it is, just do it. Just do it. Thank you so much for being here. To our audience, whatever it is, just do it. Get started. Take that action. Till next time. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Are Not Your Scars. Be sure to implement the tools and strategies shared today as you create a limitless life. Know that you are worthy. You are resilient. You are unbreakable. And you are unstoppable. Find more episodes of this podcast at youarenotyourscarspodcast.com. While you may have been forged by fire, you are free by design.